Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to Medicine Grand Rounds. Uh, my name is Vinny Chopra. I'm the chairman of the Department of Medicine, and I am pleased to be the official MC for today's Grand Rounds, which has gotten off to a beautiful start. Um, we're pleased to be back in person this year in Krugman. Uh, I, for those of you online, the room is full, so please join us if you're online. Uh, we will continue to offer hybrid uh, compatibility for the next uh, several months. Uh, upcoming talks, May 31st, we'll have our seventh annual Shark Tank competition presented both live and online. You should come for that. You might see me looking a little different. I'll leave it at that. Um, and June 7th, we'll hear from our very own Dr. Anjali Kalra, who is presenting on the importance of penicillin allergy delabeling. As always, CME and mock credit is available and questions from the live audience as well as from the Zoom Q&A will be moderated by our chief residents who are not presenting today. Um, and now I am very pleased to welcome today's speakers, three of our very own chief medical residents presenting their final chief resident presentations of the year, Drs. Brady Campbell, Kara Saxon, and Emily Scott. Let me tell you a little bit about these incredible women. I'll begin with Dr. Brady Campbell. Uh, she completed her undergraduate education at Amherst College, where she was the captain of the ice hockey team and a two-time national champion. And she still has all of her teeth, by the way. Um, she completed medical school at Tufts, where she also had advanced training with a master's in biomedical science. Uh, she completed her, her residency here, of course, in the categorical track, and she will be a fellow in our GI program next year. Yes. Uh, Dr. Kara Saxon completed her undergraduate training at the University of Montana, where she graduated summa cum laude, a medical school at the University of Washington, where she was AOA, and an internship residency here uh, on the categorical track as well. She will be with us also next year as a fellow in cardiology. Uh, and Dr. Emily Scott completed her undergraduate training at Washington State University, where she also graduated summa cum laude a medical school at the University of Washington, where she also obtained an MPH in epidemiology. Uh, she completed her training on the primary care track here in our residency program, and she will be an academic primary care attending here at CU next year. Uh, I've known these women for a year plus now. Each of them have been remarkable leaders at every stage of their training, including as outstanding chief residents during my year here. They continue to lead as chief residents, and as you will hear today, they have been advocates for women and women leaders in medicine. Please join me in welcoming Drs. Campbell, Saxon, and Scott to Medicine Grand Rounds. Thank you. All right, thank you, Vineet, for that very kind introduction. Um, hello to everyone here. Um, and everyone online. We are really excited to be here today to talk with you all. The title of our talk today is Bump Date, Optimization of Parental Leave and Family Support in Medical Trainees. I'm Brady, and this is my son, Aiden, who was born during my PGY2 year. And I'm Kara, and this is my son, Carson, who was born during my PGY3 year. And I'm Emily. This is my daughter, Marin, who was born this year. We have no financial disclosures, but we do want to disclose that we are three cis white women who all have partners who are not in medicine. Before we jump into it, though, we want to take a moment to thank the many trainees and faculty who have helped to pave the way for us to have the leave that we had and the platform today to be here to talk with you all about a, passion, a topic we are all very passionate about. These are just a few of the individuals who supported Kara, Emily, and I's journeys, both personally and professionally, as we made the decision to grow our families during training. Today, we're gonna to talk with you about the unique implications of pregnancy, parental leave, and return to work for medical trainees. We're gonna outline the economic and social benefits of parental leave, lactation support, childcare, and assisted reproductive technology, and finally, we're gonna craft a vision for what comprehensive and inclusive parental support would look like. So to achieve those learning objectives, we're gonna go through three cases. The first is a case from the past so that we can learn from our history. The second, a case from the present in which we pull from our collective experiences going through pregnancy and parenthood as residents. And finally, a case for the future in which we look at our vision for how we can provide comprehensive and inclusive support for parents who are trainees. We're also going to explore four different topics. First is how medical trainees are unique compared to other employees. 
families, how policies shape the family leave that is available to us, and what we can learn from industries outside of healthcare. And then finally, that optimization of family leave and support for medical trainees. So to start, we want people, if they feel comfortable, to raise their hand if they identify with this statement. I had a child during training. My partner had a child during training. I know someone who had a partner during, or a child during training, most all of us. And for this last one, don't raise your hand, but think to yourself, I would have had a child during training if I had more support. And so it turns out we are not the only ones talking about this. Mother's Day was this month, and on Mother's Day, Med Twitter had a trend in which mother physicians posted about the challenges they faced having kids during their training. People who told them that they shouldn't have kids during training. One person was told, you didn't come to the hospital to pump out babies, you came to work. All of these people face challenges and they all dream for a better system for our current trainees. And so that's what we're gonna talk about today. So let's dive into case one. This is Suzanne Coven, a prominent internist and writer at MGH. And she did her training at Johns Hopkins back in the 1980s. And during her PGY one year, she became pregnant and she recounts her story in this New England Journal of Medicine article where she describes working 24 hours on, 24 hours off for the majority of her pregnancy. And during her third trimester, she develops preeclampsia and has to take six weeks of bed rest leading up to the emergency C-section of her son, and afterwards has to return to work much sooner than she would have liked. And she compares her story to that of a colleague in this article, and um, a colleague who ended up deferring childbearing until after training. And she describes, though we had different experiences and made different choices, we shared a common assumption. We couldn't expect to have a healthy pregnancy and successfully complete residency with our peers. Well, we are here today to challenge that mm -hmm. assumption. So let's think of some of the factors that put Dr. Coven in this position in the first place. We're gonna start by talking about how medical trainees face unique challenges as parents. And this first point that I wanna make, I think comes as no surprise to any of us. And that is that women were historically underrepresented in medicine. And so this graph from the AAMC from 2019 outlines the percentage of women in medicine dating back to the 1980s when only 25% of medical school graduates were women. And as we see these lines begin to merge, we can begin to envision the need for um, our policies and supports for parents in medicine to evolve. And just so you know that this trend isn't slowing down, in 2022, 56% of medical school matriculants were women. Now let's take a look at the number of residents in our own program who have had kids over the last 13 years. The key takeaway here is that we saw a massive increase in residents growing their families after the COVID-19 pandemic. Some might call this the Katie effect, but we know that there are many people that have worked behind the scenes to build a supportive environment for our residents. We'll come back to this later on when we discuss how to support these residents who are expanding their families during training. The second point we wanna call out is the fact that residency training occurs during peak fertility for a lot of women. This study done by JAMA outlines how the average age of starting medical school is 24, which puts the average age of starting residency around 28. And physicians typically have their first pregnancy when they are 32, which is five years later than the national average for non-physicians, which is 27. So this graph on the right shows how physicians delay childbearing, but eventually the cumulative probability of having kids ends up catching up, but not until age 38 when these pregnancies are much higher risk. So why is it problem problematic to tell residents to just wait till after training to have kids? Well, a medical career comes at a cost and that cost is often infertility. About a quarter of female physicians report struggling with infertility and the average age of diagnosis of infertility is just 33 to 34 years old. And about a third of those cases um, are attributed to low ovarian reserve. This was the case for Dr. Marshall, who's a prominent hematologist at the Mayo Clinic. 
And she described something that I think a lot of us um, can resonate with. For many physicians like me, everything is so planned. Many of us decide to wait until we're done with our training and are financially independent to have kids. And that doesn't happen until we're in our mid to late 30s. So residents should be allowed to choose when they have kids and not be forced to wait until after training to do so. But let's shift gears a little bit and think about the residents who do pursue pregnancy during their training and um, some of the pregnancy complications associated. This is a prominent paper from the New England Journal dating back to 1990. And it compares the pregnancy outcomes of women residents compared to the partners of male residents. And even more disturbing than the paper simply referring to the control group throughout the paper as the wives is the fact that the women residents experience significantly higher rates of premature labor and preeclampsia compared to the control group. So what's changed in the last 25 years? In addition to continued higher rates of preterm labor and continued um, higher rates of hypertensive disorders in pregnancy, we also see increased rates of miscarriage, placental abruption, and intrauterine growth restriction for our residents who become pregnant. So what are the reasons for all of these pregnancy complications? Several articles have looked at the reasons that residents experience higher rates of pregnancy complications. And this meta-analysis does a nice job of summarizing. These graphs show the relationship between working long hours on preterm delivery on the left, night shifts and preterm delivery in the middle, and night shifts and miscarriage on the right. And you'll notice the odds ratio greater than one represented by the diamond to the right of the vertical line which means that long hours are associated with preterm delivery and night shift work is associated with both preterm delivery and higher rates of miscarriage. Um, and our second to last point is that medical residents face um, financial disadvantages and it's represented by this graph. So the average uh, stipend for a PGY-1 here in Colorado is $63,000 a year. And when you combine that with the average debt of uh, medical school being 240,000 now, the debt to income ratio is um, astounding. We're gonna come back to this point when we discuss childcare later on. And finally, I wanna talk a little bit about the implications of having a kid um, during residency and the inf inflexible career transitions. Time-based training means that everyone must complete a certain number of clinical months during residency in order to graduate. If a resident extends training by a month due to family leave, this has major implications for their career. For example, most fellowships have a fixed start date of July 1st, which leaves only one week of wiggle room between ending residency and starting fellowship for a lot of people. In addition, the ABIM boards exam is only offered for a couple dates every August. And other than that, you have to wait until the next year to take the test. So for example, if a 32 year old resident defers a faculty position by just one year, they lose a lifetime earnings of about 700,000. And that's when you account for lost wage growth and lost retirement assets over time. So that brings us full circle and we end with Dr. Coven's initial quote, that is, though we had different experiences and made different choices, we shared a common assumption that we couldn't expect to have a healthy pregnancy and successfully complete residency with our peers. So that was case one. And now I wanna bring us up to the present day and we're gonna dive into a case that helps highlight some of the policies that help shape family leave today. All right, so let's meet Claire. Claire is a 32-year-old G1P0 resident who's 13 weeks pregnant. She just told her APD that she's pregnant and they set up a meeting to discuss her leave options and adjust her schedule for the remainder of her pregnancy. Designing parental leave for our trainees is complex. The duration, reimbursement, and possible need for extension of training are mediated at the federal, soon to be state, as well as program level policies. It will not likely come as a surprise to most of you in this room, but we in the US remain the only OECD country to not have paid leave. In fact, the US remains one of six countries in the world um, that does not have paid national leave. You'll see in the map here, the orange highlights countries that do not have paid leave. 
The U.S. stands out to us, and the next country you can probably make out is Papua New Guinea, and the remainder are small islands off the Pacific that are really challenging to even make out on this map. Among OECD countries with parental leave, the average length of leave for maternity is 17 weeks and paternity two weeks. The discrepancy is reflected in the fact that while 37 of 38 countries have maternity specific policies, only 27 countries have specific paternity policies. So what do we have here in the US? We have something called the Family Medical Leave Act. This is an unpaid leave that offers job protection. And while job protection is not something we typically consider relevant when discussing our trainees, we do think it's important to reflect on who is and who is not covered by the current policy. It covers individuals who work for an employer that has greater than 50 employees and individuals who have worked for that employer for greater than 12 months. Individuals can utilize FMLA for both their own personal illness to care for that of a family member who is sick, as well as for um, parental leave. Who's not covered by FMLA? It's truly not an inclusive policy and nearly 40% of the US population is uncovered. And individuals not covered are disproportionately women, single parents and underrepresented minorities. Because strides towards a national policy have largely been unfruitful, there's been a shift in the US to improve coverage at the state level. The red in the map here reflects states in which there is no paid family leave laws in place. And the blue and pink reflect states that have paid family leave laws that are either currently active or about to be active. And that's us here in Colorado. In 2020, Colorado approved the first voter approved paid family medical leave program in the country. Under family, um, individuals have access to 12 weeks of paid leave. You are eligible as long as you have worked for 180 days for an employer and earned a minimum of $2,500 in wages. It's financed equally by contributions from an employer and an employee. And here in Colorado, that's 0.45% of our paycheck. We started contributing payments to the family fund in, the January, in January of 2023, but it officially goes live in January of 2024. And we're still waiting to hear about what the exact implications of this policy will be on our trainees. There are also, in addition to the federal and state policies, three policies that are unique to internal medicine trainees. We're governed by the American Board of Medical Specialties, ACGME, and ABIM. The ABMS in 2020 recommended a minimum of six weeks of leave without extension of training. And in 2022, ACGME followed suit, recommending six weeks of 100% paid leave that is effective on day one of training which is different from our FMLA and paid family leave that require a duration worked before able to access the benefits. ABIM complicates things a little bit and they um, require a maximum of five weeks per year or 105 days over a three-year residency that an individual can be away from clinical duties without extension of training. They do have a caveat that a, a trainee must work for 30 out of 36 of those months on a clinical service. And so when we consider our vacation as three months over our three years, that really only leaves three non-clinical months to be utilized for things like research, parental leave, et cetera. They do have a slight caveat in that there's an ABIM deficits and required training in which a trainee can utilize a one-time 35-day extension as long as they are deemed competent by their program. So going back to Claire, what are her leave options? There are really four components that we can put together to form a leave policy for a trainee. It's a combination of GME leave, non-clinical rotations, vacation, and unpaid FMLA, which often requires extension of training. And so looking at Claire, Claire had already used two months of research uh, as non-clinical months as she prepares to apply for fellowship. Claire utilized for her leave two weeks of GME sick leave, four weeks of her vacation for that year and a four week non-clinical rotation to total 10 weeks of paid leave without extension of training. So moving on, Claire is now 32 weeks pregnant. She's currently on a UCH medicine rotation and gets diagnosed with severe intrauterine growth restriction. She requires twice weekly NSTs and biweekly BPPs. During her pregnancy, she works 28 hour calls in the Denver Health MICU and night shifts in the COVID ICU. We want to take a moment to highlight and celebrate some really important victories on the path to developing an inclusive and comprehensive leave policy for our trainees. 
Led by Dr. Christian, the Family Medical Leave GME Task Force was established in the fall of 2022. The goal of this task force was to help establish a unified GME policy for programs that helps to break down the options available for trainees, as well as to provide specific guidelines on pre and postnatal schedule adjustments. For Claire, this would mean removal of 28 hour calls and night shifts as Kara emphasized, put her at greater risk during her pregnancy, as well as supporting high medical need pregnancies like Claire that are gonna require frequent visits near um, in the days to weeks leading up to her delivery. And finally, it also highlights the need to develop um, plans to support our trainees when they return to work. Specific to us here in the CU IMRP um, program is that as of Monday of this week, we officially eliminated all 28 hour call in our program. And while we can't begin to list all of the people that were instrumental in making this happen, we do want to draw attention to what this means as we think about what we value as a training program and an institution. So returning to Claire, she was induced at 37 weeks and delivered a healthy baby boy. She's now nine weeks postpartum and preparing to return to work next week. Her partner is starting his 12 week paternity leave when she goes back to work. She's feeling particularly nervous about her ability to successfully pump while completing her clinical duties. So let's join Claire on her lactation journey. At 10 weeks, she returns to week, work from her non-clinical rotation, and she is now on wards. She starts out by pumping every three hours, which is what is recommended. But two weeks in, at 12 weeks, work is really busy, and it makes it difficult to pump regularly. She starts going four to five hours between pumping, and her milk supply decreases as a result. Let's explore why this might be, what the reality is for our residents who are pumping. So this is a photo of one of the lactation rooms at our hospitals. It at best could be called semi-private. There is an elevator that opens into it. The curtain doesn't even extend to where you're sitting as you are pumping. It has a space to place your pump, but it doesn't have a computer. It doesn't have a phone. You have no ability to get clinical work done while you are taking time away to pump. This is also located in a completely different part of the hospital than where our wards are located. So it takes time to walk to that space, to prepare all of your pumping materials, to pump, and then you have to clean all of your supplies so that you can then pump again less than three hours later. Claire also feels guilty because she is interrupting rounds to go pump. She gets admissions right before she plans to pump and feels the pressure to go see those patients before she finishes and goes to pump. And these are the things that make her start extending that time between pumping sessions. So with this, Claire starts triple feeding. She feeds her baby, immediately pumps afterwards to try and increase milk supply, and then has to supplement with formula. And Claire is not alone. We know that physicians do not receive adequate support for lactation. Among physicians who lactate, only 60% report adequate space to pump at work, and only 50% report adequate time. It's even worse amongst residents. 92% of lactating residents report trouble breastfeeding and pumping after returning to work. And over 60% experience decreased milk supply because of inadequate time and space. And so for Claire, at five months, she is forced to stop breastfeeding because she does not have adequate milk supply to support her baby's growth and development. And again, Claire is not unique. She's not alone in this. So similar to the study that uh, Kara presented to us that looked at pregnancy complications in female residents as com uh, compared to the partners of male residents. This looked at female trainees and the partners of male trainees with breastfeeding outcomes. And you can see on the left at six months, there were similar percentages of the female trainees and the partners of male trainees were breastfeeding. And then at 12 months, there's a huge attrition in our female trainees being able to breastfeed that is not seen in the partners of male trainees. And this is an important comparison, because these are similar groups in terms of socioeconomic status, access to medical care. The distinction is their work environment. All right, so now that Claire is back to work for a month and her baby's 14 weeks old, they just received news that their daycare is delaying their start date by six months, four months after her and her husband's collective parental leave ends. 
For those of you in this room who have both children at home and grown children, the fact that we have had a childcare crisis in this country that's extended over three decades won't come as a surprise to you. And for those of you who had a pandemic baby, this probably rings a little bit too close to home. 35% of physicians before the pandemic reported a difficulty finding childcare. 27% require additional care beyond the standard of ch standard childcare in order to align with their long work hours, nights, and weekends worked. COVID really revealed the fragility of the U.S. childcare system when nearly half a million workers left um, the workforce. And while we've made some improvement in the last two years, it still remains 10% below pre-pandemic levels, which causes ongoing challenges in finding available childcare. And for residents, access is not the only barrier to childcare. As Kara alluded to earlier, residents have an incredibly high debt to income ratio and the cost of childcare can be cost prohibitive. In Denver here, the average cost of childcare is $1,500 a month. And when we look at infant care, which is particularly relevant to our trainees, that cost is even higher. And a national survey of trainees across the country revealed that pre-tax, 43% um, of trainees' pre-tax salary is used on childcare, and that 63% relied on multiple sources to meet the demands of rainy, uh, resident schedules. We're all familiar with the phrase, it takes a village to raise a child, but it also takes a village to support that child's parent. As you can see from the map on the left here, the black stars represent where Emily, Kara, and my families live. None of us here have family in Colorado, and we moved here to take advantage of the incredible training environment. And we're not alone. Due to the efforts of our program and our institution to improve diversity, we have successfully recruited individuals from all over the country and all over the globe, um, with a number of our international uh, medical graduates sitting here in the room with us today. The removal of trainees from their village becomes challenging as we ask them to reconcile the demands of their long work days with that of childcare. And so who bears the burden of these irreconcilable schedules? The burden falls largely on women and non-physician partners. Female plastic surgery residents um, miss twice as many shifts when compared to their male colleague parents. And in dual physician marriages, 87% versus 59% of men arrange their work schedule to accommodate childcare responsibilities. And perhaps the most striking for the three of us who have um, partners who are not in medicine is the burden in which we place on our non-physician partners. 99% of non-physician partners worked prior to the arrival of a baby. Only 51% of them returned to the same hours and job and 27% no longer worked. And the, the number one reason cited was to be able to provide affordable um, and accessible childcare. So to summarize Claire, she's a 32 year old G1P1 resident whose pregnancy was complicated by fetal growth restriction. Her lactation journey ended prematurely and she struggled to find reliable and affordable childcare. We can do better. And so before we switch to telling you about our vision for an inclusive and comprehensive parental leave policy that supports our trainees throughout their individual experiences, we wanna take a quick detour to tell you about what we can learn from other industries. Paid family leave not only allows us to attract and recruit top trainees, but also build strong diverse teams and ultimately retain them as faculty. People are asking about and demanding leave. 77% of, of respondents to a survey completed by Deloitte revealed that 77% um, of them would choose one employer over the other based on parental leave support. We also know that gender and ethnically diverse teams are more likely to financially outperform their non-diverse counterparts. A series of studies by McKinsey over the last decade have highlighted clearly this impact. You'll see in 2014, 2017, and 2019, which are represented by the gray, white, and blue bubble graphs, um, that companies, when compared between the first and the uh, first quartile and the fourth quartile in gender and ethnic diversity, outperformed their counterparts. For gender diversity, that's as high as 25% based on the most recent data. And for ethnic diversity, that's 36%. So where do we as a healthcare industry fare? More granular analysis of this data set revealed that over 50% of healthcare companies have actually experienced a decline in their ethnic and gender diversity since 2014. 
we know that diversity does not equal inclusion. And so this study then further analyzed and compared uh, diversity and inclusion metrics across different industries using survey and company research on sentiment analysis. We're going to look at healthcare specifically. Both diversity and leadership, which are on the top, um, are markers of a commitment to a systematic approach to inclusion and diversity. The bottom three, uh, the bottom three, equality, openness, and belonging are all core components of inclusion. And while we don't typically associate blue with a negative response, here that's what it indicates. Blue is negative, the light gray is neutral, and dark gray is positive. And in all cases, greater than 50% of all experience had either negative or neutral sentiments as it pertains to the core components of inclusion. So hiring diverse talent isn't enough. It's the experience that they have in the workplace that shapes whether they remain and whether they thrive. If we want to retain our employees, we have to intentionally develop systems in which we allow them to show up as their whole selves at work. Paid family leave is one of those systems, and we can draw on the tech industry and companies like Google to understand just how parental leave effectively improves um, retention. 43% of new hires quit due to unmet expectations, which ends up costing companies about 30% when considering recruitment time and resources. When Google expanded its leave in 2007 from 12 to 18 weeks, the retention rate post-maternity leave increased by 50%. This is otherwise known as the Google effect. And a prominent um, employment lawyer, Asha Santos, um, puts this really poignantly. How a woman is treated in the months leading up to her maternity leave, during, and then shortly thereafter she returns to work, determine whether or not a company will retain her. And the case for inclusive leave is not just for businesses, it's also for families and societies. It's financially meaningful and it helps to foster stronger family relationships. It's a persistent fact that across time and countries that women earn less than men. The debate isn't whether or not this gap exists, but why. New data suggests that this gap may actually be better qualified as a motherhood penalty. You'll see in the graph on the left that at the time of first childbirth, a mother's income suffers by a 30% reduction. It recovers slightly around two years, but persists at about a 20% reduction when compared to their male counterparts with children. On the right, I wanna draw your attention to the fact that this is not a parenthood effect. This is a true motherhood effect. There is no difference between men with and without children. So you might be thinking to yourself, how does extending maternity leave improve this? Doesn't that mean women are out of the workforce for longer? And you'd be right. We're not here to argue for an exclusive maternity leave policy, but rather a policy and a culture that encourages shared parental duties amongst parents. This idea is further supported by a group out of Denmark who evaluated the effect of a duration of paternity leave on a mother's and a family's long-term earnings. A mother's income rose 7% for every one month of paternity leave a father took. It also resulted in long-term um, benefits for the families and greater financial security as a collective unit. This not only reduces this motherhood penalty, but shrinks the gender pay gap. And it's not, it's also a relationship win for families. Um, it improves um, greater child-father bonding and also relationship stability. This is a study done by McKinsey in 2021 that shows 90% of men who took paternity leave noted improvement in their relationship with their partners. And multiple sociology papers have drawn attention to the lack of paternity leave being a strong predictor for postpartum depression in mothers. So as we think forward to our vision, we know that maternity leave is not enough. We need to build a comprehensive and inclusive plan that supports all parents throughout their pregnancy and parenting journey. So to craft our vision for this, we want to present our case for the future and introduce Mia, who is a 32-year-old woman, and May, who's a 35-year-old woman. They are partners, and they are both PGY2 residents in our program. They want to have a baby. May would like to carry the pregnancy, and they're hoping to use in vitro fertilization. So to craft our vision for what fertility support would look like, we have to understand what our current benefits look like under GMEA. And I wanna highlight some positive aspects. 
you do not need to have a diagnosis of infertility to access assisted reproductive technology like IVF. This is important for same-sex couples. You also have access to up to three OO site uh, retrieval cycles, which is important as we know folks in their 30s need often at least two cycles to be able to successfully become pregnant. But one limitation is that fertility preservation services are for medical conditions only. If you are doing this for elective reasons because you have chosen to delay having kids because of your training environment, you do not have any coverage for those services. There's another significant limitation that's specific to trainees in same-sex partnerships like Mia and May. All of the expenses in blue are not covered. And these are all of the steps that same-sex couples need in the IVF process. They have a financial burden that heterosexual couples do not. And it really adds up. For Mia and May under our current benefits, these are the costs for every, or for every step of an IVF cycle. And for one cycle only, it would be over $10,000, which is one sixth of their pre-tax salary. And employers who provide these expanded fertility benefits like we would advocate for, tell us that it actually benefits them as an employer. It helps them attract and retain top talent. It helps them build diverse and inclusive employees and workforce, and it helps them mitigate high-risk pregnancies and the costs associated with them. And 97% of these co companies that do offer these expanded benefits tell us that they haven't experienced increased costs associated with offering full IVF services. And so in our world that we are envisioning for Mia and May, they have access to expanded coverage to the full benefits. And May is able to get pregnant after two rounds. And so May and Mia have a healthy baby at 38 weeks gestation via C-section. No other birth complications. Mia plans to do cardiology fellowship and May plans to be a hospitalist. And we know that family is coming to Colorado to a world near us very, very soon. We don't know exactly how CU and plans to implement this and how it would affect trainees, but we want to propose our vision for how we could use this as an opportunity to better support trainees. And so we would still have our GME sick leave. There would be two options for leave. And in addition to the GME sick leave, there would be Colorado family leave, up to 12 weeks. And the pay for a PGY2 would be $910 per week. That's 70% of their salary. There would still be the option to take non-clinical rotations during which they are working but able to stay at home, and if they so desire, to take vacation. What might this look like for May and Mia? So they both choose to take the two weeks of GME sick leave, and when they return, they both choose to return to a non-clinical rotation. But May, as the birthing parent who went through a C-section, needs more physical time to heal as well as to bond with her baby, takes the full 12 weeks of family leave. Mia, as the non-birthing parent, decides to only take six weeks of family leave. And the key aspect that we want to advocate for is that their training extension be determined by competency, not by an arbitrary number of time. And so for Maya and Mia, uh, for May and Mia, they may extend training, they may not. And that's especially important for Mia as she plans to go into fellowship. And just because they took leave does not mean that they have to extend. It is determined by their clinical abilities to meet those competency milestones. The next major question is who covers for Mia and May during leave? May was gone for a full four months. We know from surveys that 50% of residents and 37% of attendings reported that they had to pay back their call after their leave. And also from surveys of residents, about a third say that they feel that the current system for coverage for maternity and paternity leave puts too much strain on non-parental residents. And when we go back to our graph of the number of residents in our program who are having kids during residency, we have seen this huge increase. 
And we need to expect this. This is not something that is going away. And we need to build this into our schedules for residents to have redundancy, to have more residents than we need, because we should be anticipating that so many residents are out on leave at a given time. And that's both parental leave, sick leave, and residents that have to be out on leave for other reasons as well. This should be inclusive of all residents and supporting all residents, including residents that don't choose to have kids and be a parent during residency. And so May is returning to work after 14 weeks of leave and her four weeks of a non-clinical rotation. She wants to be able to breastfeed for at least a year. And the good news is May is off to a good start. So data tells us that residents who get more than six weeks of leave were able to breastfeed for an average of nine months as compared to six months for residents who had less than six weeks of leave. So the leave that May was able to get is going to support her as she's been able to establish a milk supply and create that bond with her baby. And in April 2023, just last month, the PUMP Act went into effect in the United States. And this provides legal, legal protection for employees for one year after their child's birth to be able to pump at work. And what this stipulates is that they have reasonable break time. If they work, this break time must be paid and that they must have a private lactation space that cannot be a bathroom. It also stipulates that they need to have access to refrigeration and sink nearby to this lactation space. And when we think about May and how to support her, we want to go beyond these like bare minimum necessities that the Pump Act uh, provides protections for. And so I spent a long time on the internet looking for a photo of the ideal lactation room, and it seems to not exist online at least. Um, so we had to add a few things. Um, but beyond the necessities, a sink, a refrigeration uh, system. We also wanna add that someone should have access to a phone to answer pages, to a workstation so that they can do their clinical duties while they are pumping if that is what they want to do. And then residents in surveys have also told us that having access to a hospital grade pump so that they don't have to carry their supplies and set it up every time, which is time consuming. And then also access to lactation resources like a, like a lactation specialist would help them be more successful as they return to work and are pumping. And so we imagine all of those things for May and that she has these supports. And because of that, she is able to breastfeed her son for over a year. Now I wanna switch gears and we're gonna go back to Mia and May. And now their son has come down with a fever. What are they gonna do? May is on the D Denver Health MICU and Mia is on U wards, but both of their families live in Texas. So what do residents tell us helps? On-site daycare is cited time and time again as the highest priority for residents. We, um, this Vanderbilt study asked residents if offered on-site childcare, would it influence their decision between two otherwise equal residencies? And 71% of respondents said yes, and that was regardless of gender. And at Stanford, women physicians ranked access to emergency on-site childcare as the most important need to improve their career success and faculty well-being. It's time to start treating our residents as potential faculty and use this as a recruiting tool for our top talent. On-site childcare is considered a bedrock benefit. Patagonia has offered subsidized on-site childcare at its headquarters for decades, along with several other companies, including Disney, Home Depot, Boeing, Procter & Gamble, and many others. And when studied, these companies report improved employee retention, improved employee productivity, improved morale and loyalty, and more important is women in leadership. A study in 2019 found that 25 to 35 percent of postpartum mothers never returned to work, whereas 100 percent of moms that worked at Patagonia did. This benefit extends beyond moms with 25% less turnover in the general po employee population for those who have children with on-site childcare. What would it look like for a world um, where Bright Horizons didn't have a wait list that was two to three years long and offered subsidized rates for residents that they could actually access? And to take childcare one step further, I wanna imagine a world in which Mia and May didn't have to call out of work when their son was sick. Other hospital systems like the Mayo Clinic, Michigan, Northwestern, and Penn all offer sick childcare to their employees, which have extended hours that align with physician schedules. 
as well as on-site nurses or nurse practitioners who can actually diagnose and um, treat their kids when they're sick. These come with varying costs to the employee. Some are included in their benefits and some are offered with um, small out-of-pocket costs. But this allows um, us to take care of our sick kids and not be out of work um, so that we can continue staffing our hospitals. So in this world, instead of calling out sick, Mia and May are able to drop their son off at Anschutz um, employee sick daycare. He's evaluated by a nurse practitioner who diagnoses him with an ear infection and gets antibiotics started. And Mia is able to walk over after rounds to check on him. And both Mia and May work a full day of clinical care. And so that brings us full circle. We've looked at the past, present, and we've envisioned a future for family leave. And I want to leave you with one final thought. And that is this, regardless of pregnancy or parenthood during training, this topic affects all of us as an institution and reflects what we value in terms of time, finances, and culture. So our vision includes supporting our trainees as they take time for leave, as well as time when they return to work. In terms of financial values, we want to expand our benefits to support families. And finally, we need a culture that is inclusive at recruiting and re retaining diverse teams. We look forward to the future where we can better support residents as they grow their families during training. And finally, we had so many people that have supported us on this journey that we did not have enough, uh, we had too many to include on one slide. So you can find some of you in this room on our three slides of faculty to thank. Um, and then we also want to give a special thank you to all of our program administrators who are so instrumental in creating these systems for our residents to be able to take leave and get support as they return. And finally, the best way to end is with photos of our residents and their families. Um, and if you ever need faculty and residents to respond immediately to an email, just ask them for photos of their kids. It happens. <laughs> So thank you all. Thank you. Guys, what, what a great talk. If, if for those of you online, I don't think you heard the awes in the room with all the pictures, but uh, it really was palpable. Uh, thank you. Uh, I actually took some notes and I was reflecting on my journey. I didn't get any paternity leave, and uh, that's something that we definitely need to change. So I appreciate the equity angle on the family aspects. Um, can you talk to me a little bit about programs in the country that you look at as role models for this? Are there Does that even exist? Uh, what, what is your sort of research shown in that sense? I think it's piecemeal because there's certain programs that we can look at each component and say they're doing this well, but there's not a single program to say like they have the whole package. And I think that's the opportunity for us to be leaders in that aspect. Like there is no one that is a single leader and that could be us. And so when we look at this, um, the UC system in, Cal in California has recently been able to expand their fertility coverage to residents so that the whole IVF process is covered. And then Kara was talking to us about other programs that have on-site childcare that's accessible, that have that sick childcare that's accessible. And so it's a little bit of, from each part of the country, some people are doing one component well, but no one that has the whole package. Thanks, guys. That was an amazing talk. Um, you guys have thought a lot about this, and so I just wanted to hear your thoughts on whether what differences should be made in terms of birthing versus non-birthing parents and in terms of the leave and the support that they are given. Um, I think that's a great question, and I think it's hard as we prepared this talk to um, speak to the equity throughout everything, but as Vineet mentioned, I think there is, um, there are certain things that need to be specific to a birthing parent, like extension of leave for healing that does not exist for a non-birthing parent. Um, however, the time off and the culture around whether or not we suggest to our um, non-birthing colleagues that they only take two weeks versus taking a full leave is really important. Because without that leave, we know that the rates of uh, postpartum depression are higher. We know that there are financial implications to that. And so really this policy that we envision is an inclusive policy for both birthing and non-birthing parents.
Thanks to you all. That was amazingly well-researched and I just learned so much uh, from all of you as usual. Um, but I wanted to bring up more of a comment than a question, um, but I feel that these parental policies have a huge implication for drawing women into um, longer fellowship trainings as well, um, especially those where there are procedures involved in training and in the career. And I know, Kara, you've thought about this too. Um, and um, because it's really hard, right? It's really hard pumping when you're doing procedures and figuring out how to balance that. Um, and I think it is something that as a department or and as a university, we actually have to think about the support for for advanced trainees and for faculty too, as they're navigating those things. Oh, this is so great. Thanks for bringing it up. I promise you weren't a plant. Um, <laughs> yeah, this was a slide that we had to get rid of just for time, but this is a look at um, our female representation in fellowship specifically. And I highlighted here some of our like most procedure heavy specialties and that being cardiology, gastroenterology and pulmonary and critical care. And we still see um, much lower rates of female representation in those specialties compared to, say, more ambulatory or non-procedural based specialties like endocrinology, geriatrics, and rheumatology. And so the thing that I was going to say about this slide was that this doesn't just apply to medical school and residency. This comprehensive policy needs to be GME-wide and carry into fellowship so that we can um, support our fellows who are engaging in procedures and um, extending their training even further. Thanks for bringing that up. So a perfect segue to an online comment slash question. This is from Dr. Flores, who is our vice chair for diversity, equity, and inclusion. I'll read it out so you can actually get the full flavor of the whole question. She says, what a great presentation. It really makes my blood boil that today in 2023, this is still an issue. I worked on a Department of Medicine parental leave policy that was approved by all leaders for faculty and staff in the department. However, when I tried to expand this to house staff, I faced incredible barriers, starting with the fact that, quote, residents have to fulfill ACGME minimum requirements for training, close quote. I don't know how to move this forward. How can you leverage your information in order to demand changes? How can you demand changes for trainees when in the U.S., as you point out, this is not considered to be paid leave a priority for anyone? What do you suggest we should do as a profession? I love that question so much. And I think this really relates back to some of our business case. Um, and I think if you take one thing away from this talk, it's that residents and trainees should be considered as faculty recruits for an institution. If you want to retain your top talent, then you need to start treating your residents as future employees. And so I think, one, it requires a culture shift in our institution of viewing our residents differently. And two, um, getting to some of the constraints of our policy, specifically with like ABIM requiring 30 out of 36 clinical months. Um, we had a grand rounds a few weeks ago that was all, all about um, competency-based training. And so if you took away that arbitrary 30 clinical months in order to graduate on time, then you could see a world where you might be able to take an extended leave and graduate on time and thus not have to defer fellowship decisions or faculty positions. So I think really pushing for competency-based training would allow residents to be able to access some more of these policies, especially the family um, act that we're seeing start in Colorado, so that maybe they could access the full 12 weeks of partially paid leave and not have to extend their training. <clears throat> Sorry, I have another question, um, but it, that last comment dovetails into this. So in the world in which competency-based training is probably at least a couple of years out, hopefully it will happen. How do you think that the family leave is actually gonna impact resident training given that we are still time-based? I think it's gonna be taken by certain residents, for example, by someone like me that's planning into going into primary care that's not planning to do fellowship because I could have extended my training and it would have not provided barriers to getting a job afterwards. However, I wouldn't have been able to be a chief resident if I had chosen to be a parent earlier in residency because I would not have been on cycle with my group and I would not have been eligible to be a chief. So even for me, actually, it would have had, um, had barriers to being able to actually take it. But theoretically, folks that are planning to get a job immediately after residency and not go into fellowship, 
they would be able to take advantage of that policy versus folks that are planning to do fellowship. As of now, we have fixed start dates in July. And potentially one other solution would be to have flexibility for fellowship start dates. Um, even looking to our surgical colleagues as leaders in this, they start fellowship on August 1st rather than July 1st. And so part of their support for our surgical colleagues here at CU is that they do extend their training by a month, but it's okay because that fellowship start date is later. Versus for us in medicine, it's currently not possible, but that would be an alternative solution to make this accessible to all residents. I think I'll just elaborate one thing on that, is that the way that we currently think about our individuals who are transitioning to fellowship is pretty rigid. Outside of our individuals who have applied for fast tracking after two years, we're saying that folks after two years can successfully go into a pulmonary critical care fellowship, but that by delaying or saying that someone is competent one month earlier, they can't necessarily start a GI fellowship or cardiology fellowship as it applies to Karen and myself. Um, and so I think the way that we're thinking about it um, is pretty rigid and needs to kind of have a little bit of flex. A comment online from Dr. Sarah Jolly, uh, who says, thank you for this amazing and incredibly important talk. Yeah. Other questions, comments? I'm with uh, Dr. Flores that um, I think all of our blood should be boiling at this point because it's been going on too long. So um, thank you for the talk. When I heard about the, the plan to um, anticipate redundancy in call schedules, it seems to me that is it is something that could be accomplished more easily or more readily than some of these other policy level um, items. Um, when you guys think about you know the square of like high yield, low effort, et cetera, et cetera, it, does that fall into the high yield, low effort? And what other items might be in that area that we could focus on right now, today, tomorrow? I can take part one. Um, in terms of um, high yield, low effort, absolutely. Um, I think that when we, um, when individuals are deciding whether or not to pursue um, building their family or growing their families and training, one of the number one reasons stated for not doing that is concern over burdening their colleagues. And so I think if we can remove some of these other barriers that we talked about, in addition to removing um, knowing a one-to-one, -one, um, in my personal experience, I knew who was covering my leave and was made to feel like I was burdening them with that in, while I was out on leave. So I think if we can build the redundancy in to take away the fact that someone knows that they someone else is covering for them. This is a little bit easier in our larger residency program, but gets harder as you think down to trainee uh, fellowship programs, for instance, rheumatology, endocrinology, they're really small. And the way that I think we have to thoughtfully get around that is really um, placing leave on either non-clinical or outpatient level um, services where patients can be scheduled or rescheduled based on their duration of leave and less so on the inpatient time. Another thing that's come up is um, extra work for extra pay. And so a lot of other programs will pay people to fill in on Jeopardy. Um, of course, that comes with like its own funding barriers. But if other programs can do it, I don't see why we can't figure out a system in which um, people who have to cover other people's leave actually get compensated for that. But I realize that's not a sustainable system. That's more of a Band-Aid for a, a cultural um, issue. And I'll add, I think the other like uh, high yield, low barrier item would be lactation support. You know, the photo we showed of one of our lactation rooms for residents would not meet standards for, by the Pump Act, which is now in effect. They, we are legally required to be providing a better space to our residents. And it is not a huge cost to have a computer in that space. And that would make residents' life infinitely better. It would help them get their work done, support their team, but also get home to their family on time and not have to stay late because of the amount that they have to pump. And I think that is not a hard ask of our institutions at all. And we shouldn't have to pump in Dr. Chopra's office, which is what <laughs> I had to do my first day back from leave. <laughs> I'm not even going to try to. But that's a culture change. 
Um, thank you guys so much for this excellent talk. Um, one thing that I think is kind of interesting uh, on the pediatric side, most residents who have children take an elective called care of the well newborn. And it's obviously a lot more applicable to a future pediatrician than an internist. But while we wait for, you know, some of these changes on a more national scale with some of these larger organizations, I wonder if we could be thoughtful about potential elective options like that on an internal level to get those 30 months without having to sort of wait for these big changes to happen. I don't know if you guys have thought about those kinds of things at all or been a little creative with your elective time. I, I love that. Um, and while I don't think medicine could do care of the newborn, I think you also have like a lactation elective um, as part of the pediatric leave, which could be applicable to internal medicine. We care for patients who are lactating. Um, and that would be a wonderful thing. I think the challenge still is the requirement from ABIM for the 30 out of 36 months. Because as of now, our non-clinical months are usually research or doing boards like prep. And while like lactation would be even more flexibility in terms of the requirement for that, the total number of non-clinical rotations that you can take, there's still that limitation. And that would be the even bigger next step that we need to take. Guys, thank you very much for a great grand rounds. Uh, really stimulating conversation. Well done.